On the state density bonus, please explain again uh, what sort of development is possible in the district uh, under the current 1979 state density law. How would uh, the affordable housing bonus program bring San Francisco into compliance with state law? And how would the affordable housing bonus program serve to cap heights at seven stories? <coughs> You're looking for the visual aids. I can yeah. Work. No, actually, I just don't have the numbers memorized. Uh, that's all right. Uh, so uh, that was a lot. I'm just going to explain the things I think were asked, which is how does this work really? So the question is, what would we, what do we think would happen if we just went away from this whole affordable housing bonus local program and instead we just use the state law to mediate? So the number of units we would get are the same number of units that we would get under the state program. <clears throat> so 510. The difference is if a project shows our state program versus the state law, the state program says you only get certain heights based on this formula. The state law doesn't say anything about how much heights you get. So it's sort of up again back to that negotiated process. The state program says you can only get a change in how much of rear yard you have by a certain amount. The state law just says you get three concessions. So this one puts a limit on any of the asks based on the analysis we did with David Baker. So we asked him, can you design us a building that you really, like you would support given the state law? So the state law came in and the constraints on the site and out came a building he liked, and that's what we're regulating. A different architect, a different developer could build a very vastly different, perhaps terrible building. So we really like that we've got this analysis. <clears throat> um, I can't remember if I answered. If the local program went through, the number of units would be 1,000. The way that we can limit the height limits is these programs only allow you to do what's in our code, and we offer um, a very clear process for that. So what we think we've done is made a program that's more attractive than the state program for some sites, and that is the local program. Uh, one question about residential tenants and a couple of small business questions. One, uh, did the city implement a program for displaced tenants such as transition and neighborhood repatriation? I think one so, of these two. I can answer. I'm not entirely sure what that question's getting at, but we did, uh, Board of Supervisors recently pass uh, a neighborhood preference that would allow um, those residents within the area of a project to be able to have a greater chance of being able to access one of the units to get a preference um, for being in a neighborhood or in the supervisory district. Other than that, I'm not really sure in terms of the reparations and the other aspects of the questions. I can't really speak to it. Return with repatriation. Um, if a neighborhood business is subject to demolition for this program, uh, can the landlord break a lease? <laughs> Um, I learned more about small business uh, this week than I have the 20 years living with my dad while he ran his. But I, I would say that he, there is something that's called the demolition bomb, which is in some small commercial leases. It's up to the lease signer to notice and ask for it to be removed or not. Um, if the demolition bomb, which is, I think, trade words for a clause that says, if I choose to demolish my building, the lease is over, is in the lease, then yes, they can do that. Some leases do not have that. We are still looking for some data. You know, a lease is a private contract between two private entities. Funnily enough, they do not like to provide them to the city of San Francisco, so we don't have really clear data on how many have that clause, but I understand that it's not common and it's not uncommon. So uh, sometimes, depends on their contract. Okay. Uh, doesn't the affordable uh, housing bonus program's target map really incentivize wholesale demolition of the low rise neighborhood business districts? Mm -hmm. That's a provocative question. <laughs> right. Um, so I just want to be totally clear. 
it is really hard to develop a, a building in especially the neighborhood we're in now. As Supervisor Tang kind of talked about that, I'll tell you why. It's not because people don't want to live in your neighborhood. It's not because the ocean isn't amazing or the services aren't good. It's that the cost of construction in your neighborhood is the same as the cost of the construction right on BART, the cost per square foot. It just costs so much to pay a person to build a window. That's just it. Lumber costs the same no matter where you're building it. It varies a little by construction type. You know, if you're building a high rise, it's more expensive or not. So what that means is, you know, it sells for less out here. So people are more attracted to building in other neighborhoods. We worked really hard on the financial analysis to make a program that we think works and gets a return for project sponsors to try and encourage development. But we also didn't want to make it so lucrative that we weren't getting enough affordable housing. So it's a pretty narrow window that we're trying to kind of get through. And we did our testing on sites that had zero stories or one story. So let's say you have anything more than that. Even we've heard if you've got a really lucrative laundromat, then developers can't afford to outbid the laundromat. So there's certain businesses where the business itself is so valuable that this program won't work right now in this economy. So I don't think it's a whole, I think it's um, a small infill project that um, will, in, where buildings are not healthy or the businesses are not so lucrative, we might see it happen. Okay. Um, we've got quite a few more to get through here. Will the new affordable uh, units be interior slums? No, meaning no windows, basements, generally inferior. Sure, I can answer that one. So um, in the legislation, we added a bunch of criteria to the monitoring report that actually talks about the location of the units. And currently in all of our projects that provide on-site what we call BMR affordable units, we have a plan or a look at those sites. Those sites need to be similar to the market rate sites. So they need to be in a similar location, have a similar layout. So that's how we prevent uh, affordable units from being smaller or less quality than the market rate units. And so then we've also added that into the legislation. So, so they're, okay. they're, they're basically the same as the market rate units. Correct. Okay. Uh, so a market rate unit, uh, that gets sunshine, uh, you can have right next to it a portable unit that gets the sunshine. There's no, Correct. right, so uh, if I'm gonna buy this building, I mean a, a unit, uh, I may pay market rent, rent, I mean I may pay market price, but be on the, on the shady side of the building. Yes, you could, yes. Yep. So the same floor, everything? Yep, they like look for similarity. So they like distribute the affordable units throughout the building to match what the market rate is. That's how it's done now, and that's how it will continue to be done. And we put it in the legislation to make sure it's always done that way. <laughs> Good job. Uh, why is such a focus on people who make, I'm gonna read both these questions together because they're related. Why is such a focus on people who make 83,000 uh, a year plus? And can you please give a sample price point of an affordable housing unit compared to a market price in the same building? Thanks, Seneca. Um, so, yeah, so this is a slide we've used some of our longer presentations, but you can see here that the average rental for a one bedroom is 3490 and these prices next to the income level are what these income groups can afford to pay in housing costs per month. And afford means you're spending about 30% of your income on housing. Most people in San Francisco spend about 50% of their income on housing. So uh, this is a great goal for us to work towards. You, you can see low, very low, moderate, middle, nobody is served by um, the current market. It's, it's a very high end, the current market for both, sorry, one and two bedrooms. Um, the deficit is larger for middle income households that are larger. That makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, why are we focusing on the middle income? I feel like Jeff talked about this a lot. We are one of the many tools that the mayor is moving forward with. He talked a lot about our redevelopment for uh, Hope SF. We are building a lot of affordable housing. This is one piece of the puzzle. It's a new piece of the puzzle. We think it's critical to service more income levels, um, to maintain diversity in our cities. 
Uh, we also, um, I just had a thought and I lost it. Jeff has something to add on to here though. What we've seen over the last number of years is price escalation in the single family home market as well as in the condo market. In a growing sense um, that middle, middle class families are not able to access to, to buy a single family home. They don't have enough money to save up to be able to make the down payment. But when they are, there's a lot of people competing and they feel shut out from that, from that market. Um, and also from the condo market as well. And so what we see is a further exodus of middle-income families from the city as a result of feeling shut out of that, as well as feeling shut out of um, the rental market, given the increase in, in rental prices. Is it because they don't uh, can't find the place in the right neighborhood, or is it uh, just that they can't afford any place in the city? I think a growing sense that they can't afford, that the neighborhoods that used to be affordable for for middle-income families are no longer aff affordable because of the increase in price. So, okay. so that's what that's what we're seeing, and so part of this as a response is to be able to create a, a supply of middle-income units. And what Kirsten and others have, have figured out a way of doing is to be able to do it without any kind of uh, local subsidy. So that's what you have before you is really a you know the centerpiece of our middle-income strategy. Um, and we thought that because we saw when the units were going to be within this area that the sunset would be more open to seeing more middle income family units um, than other types of units. And so that policy choice fit well with also the geographic area where the, uh, the units will be located. Great. I'm going to try to get through the next batch of questions here. I do want to be sensitive to people's time. We're, we're going to stay as long as you want to stay. If some of you feel like you need to leave, your questions will be put online with our best answers to them. So if you feel you can't stay, it's not the, the end of the discourse. But let me let me just proceed then. A couple questions about how this the mechanics of this really work. Not sure if the process has been laid out, but I am curious to know what the application process for low income sites would look like and what laws will be in place to protect families from rising rents to come. Uh, so application process, we have a binder on that already for our existing inclusionary program. It's a lottery system, so you income qualify, and once you're income qualified, you find out about all the different units that come on the market. Um, we are working more and more to consolidate. Um, Jeff probably knows about 17 different programs. You don't need to know about those. You just need to know whether you can move into the unit, so we're working to get better at that user interface, as it were. Um, and the second question, just say one word during that. Well, just uh, how will, what laws will be in place to protect families from rising rents? So if you're in the, in the affordable units, um, your rent stays at 30% of your income. If your income goes up a little bit, you still can stay in that unit. If it doubles or some, somewhere in between there, then you'll be asked to sort of find a market rate unit and that unit will be uh, preserved for someone else at that income level. Um, and that yep. Okay, so, um, and again, this one, Kirsten, you'll have to sort of talk about the assumption within the question here, but when a developer pays a fee instead of building affordable housing, how is that determined? Is it possible that the fee is less expensive than building cost for the project? Mm -hmm. um, that is a super awesome and dirty question. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is possible. Um, we have a way of calculating the fee. It's a four-page memo on the Mayor's Office of Housing's website, and it has something to do with how much it costs the Mayor's Office to rebuild the unit. We are revisiting that methodology um, to make sure that we are both maximizing our ability to use those funds and make sure we can deliver the units we want. So whoever asked that question, feel free to find me afterwards and I'll point you to that document. But I think for everybody, we need to clarify whether that pertains to the density oh, bonus. thank you. Okay. I'm getting tired. So <laughs> just to be totally clear, if you choose to pay the fee, you cannot use this program. You must build the affordable units on site if you're going to use this program. So you've got your building, you must have the affordable units in your building to get the density bonus. Okay. Um, in any municipalities or counties, have there been any uh, longitudinal studies that answer if the program over many years continues, 
uh, to serve its design populations. Uh, I have serious sadness that there is no encouraging of co-housing projects. Any commitment? Or any comment, I guess it says, sorry. Uh, so uh, my team have been working an amazing amount and really hard. And on the 28th, we have a big hearing. On the 29th, we're going to tour three co-housing sites in the East Bay to get our creative juices flowing on other solutions outside of this one. So that's an idea that resonates with us a lot. And the longitudinal study, we do have requirements in the legislation that we take both a, a yearly look and then a long-term look at the pro production of this program. Okay, here's one. As someone who lives on one of the program parcels on Noriega, I support this proposal. I love living in the sunset and hope to be able to continue to afford to live uh, here with my family for a long time. Why can't anything on 19th be included? The high traffic corridor seems especially well suited for more density. Uh, so 19th Ave is mainly zoned RH2, which is single family residential, allows two, two units on there, so that is why it is not in the program area. Uh, okay, these are a lot of very large questions I'm not sure we can answer tonight, uh, but we'll put uh, responses on the website. What is the population capacity of San Francisco? Uh, 8,500 tech workers use Google buses, Airbnb is unregulated, MTA and Muni are now, now lease land and buildings for training near the Tan, uh, Tan Fran Shopping Center in San Bruno. Auto return towed autos is in Daly City. What went wrong with city plan? Okay. <laughs> wow, yeah, I'll take that one. <laughs> um, and, uh, okay, and the second part of the question is how to exert uh, plan Bay Area pressure excuse me, uh, on the San Mateo and San, Santa Clara County cities to build their own workforce housing. And thirdly, will these uh, units be subject to transportation sustainability fees? I'll take the third one. Yeah, the third <laughs> one's pretty easy. <laughs> uh, I am desperate to know how to engage regionally, so whoever works that out, let me know. But uh, on a personal rather than professional level, these projects will pay transportation sustainability fees. For those of you who don't know, that means that for every square foot of residential or commercial space they pay, they build, they'll pay a certain amount of money. I think it's seven or eight dollars for residential to the city to help us build the initial investment in new transit infrastructure. We'll need to support those new residents and jobs. After that, of course, they'll pay property taxes, which will help us maintain and operate those systems. And a corollary question to that one is how does Muni slash SFMTA factor in? Are they planning to step up and improve the commute times and number of trains and buses? Carol. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know this, again, this comes up a lot. You know, we're going to build more housing. That means there's going to be more impacts on our infrastructure. Absolutely. But that's something that we have been working on separate and apart from this legislation. It's ongoing work. So, for example, right now we're heavily engaged with the community on the El Tarabel. How is it that we make it more reliable and serve people the best way possible? Next, we're going to move to Anjuda, and I'm exploring other uh, methods as well. So it's it's not in this legislation, but it's something that we are constantly working on. And, and uh, I was the lead sponsor, for example, last November on a transportation bond, our largest transportation bond that we've ever had in our history of San Francisco, really working to, again, improve our infrastructure. Do you have a question based on that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm having a couple of just, I ride the buses all the time now, and they're just packed, and it's gotten worse over the last couple of years with all this extra money supposedly flowing in. So it, it's it's hard to, I mean, a transportation bond is nice, but you got to pay, you got to hire muni drivers too, and that's not paid for a bond. That's the general fund. And, and I'm just, I'm worried about this administration when they say we got a $100 million deficit. And it's all the property pension fund. It has nothing to do with housing tax or tax development. Well, I don't want to throw MTA under the bus. Yes, I'm sorry. It's just like sitting right there. <laughs> but, um, but basically, you know, yeah, it's great. It's I've been in the city for 10 years, and I will say that when we started working with MTA and talking about transformer oriented development and all of those things, they were running a system that wasn't about moving lots of people around the city. It was about making sure everyone got a stop exactly where they wanted. So they have done an incredible amount of work figuring out how to tune up the system. And it's 
embarrassing to me as a government worker how long it's really taken from TPP to Muni forward to get to a plan and a funding strategy and environmental clearance and something the community accepts just to make our system work. And, and, and now we have that plan in place. I live near the 5 Fulton. My bus just got way faster. So maybe we don't need more drivers. We need buses that can do more routes per hour. It's another way of thinking of it. But the next thing that they're really spending a lot of time on, and Gil is leading a lot of this, so I'll defer to him on the details, is thinking both longer term and bigger regional. So that work is happening. Uh, it's a chicken and egg with development. And as a community writer myself, I, I feel you, definitely. You're going to keep up and make this stuff work. We're just beginning a very comprehensive transportation planning process now between three agencies, the planning department, the MTA, and the TA, to kind of tackle that question. Some of it does come down to money, as you're saying, uh, and some of it comes to setting priorities, some of it comes to reimagining how we move about. Um, we're not going to have the answers inside of this program on the density bonus um, in the time that we want to do this program, because it does add a little increment to that. But this is a much bigger question that I think we have to tackle in a more robust way, and, and uh, we pledge to do that. I did want to say that we're um, being kicked out of the room here shortly. They need it back uh, by 9 o'clock. So I want to say that um, there were a couple of questions here uh, that we haven't talked about, um, and that has to do with um, transportation, but a slice of it, and that has to do with where will people park and have the traffic and parking studies been done for this program. Um, I think you've covered some of that, but you may want to just touch on that again. And then I think we kind of need to wrap up. We have a few other cards we didn't get to that in some ways sound very thematically similar to many of the questions we've touched on. I do want to commit to you that we have an online um, uh, comprehensive listing of the questions that we've received uh, and our responses to those. And so those will be included uh, on, that, on that website. Do you want to just handle the, the parking? Traffic study question. Sure. We have to actually quickly. clean up. And okay, fine. No <laughs> <laughs> I'll just do this really quickly. So the parking question. So we have been working with Supervisor Tang on this question since we first went to her. It was an issue in the blueprint as well. Um, as you all know, the city, this program doesn't require one parking space for each new unit. Project sponsors can choose to provide less. Um, we know that our city is not currently parked at one to one. We only have parking requirements starting in 1955. So buildings built before then generally didn't have parking. A lot of them have added it. They generally didn't have it. Now it's one to one. Uh, we we're finding that's actually way too much parking. A lot of places build one parking space, which means they take away one street space so that they can have a driveway. So it's a net loss in terms of parking. So that's something we're learning a little more about. But the thing that we were doing really interesting with Supervisor Tang, and I have this map, but it's not totally vetted by MTA, so I didn't want to share it tonight, is looking at streets in your district that are wide enough that we can go from parallel parking to perpendicular parking. I see someone nodding their head no, but there are some benefits to that. It adds the amount of street parking you can have. It also slows traffic down, because there are a lot of streets in your neighborhood that are really wide, and the cars can go really fast. When the cars are parked perpendicular, the roads are a little bit narrower, people tend to slow down and take a little more time. So what we're looking at now is just what's the capacity to do it? What streets can you do it in? Many of your streets are wide enough. The question is, are there other concerns like fire circulation or muni circulation? So we're going to come back to the supervisor with more details on that. And I'm happy to stay over in the corner and answer further questions. Thanks. So just thank you all so much for taking the time. I know it was uh, a long meeting and half of you are still here, but um, just please know that we really value everything you're saying, your input about this, this program. We want to get it right. So thank you for especially the ones who came to the last meeting. I think there's been a lot of improvements and we'll continue to do so. So January 28th, Thursday, is the Planning Commission hearing. Uh, so I will try to keep you all posted, uh, but it looked like it was an even, almost even split on the Ocean Beach Great. Thank you, Supervisor, and thank you, everyone, for coming out. And again, we will uh, post these questions and the answers on the website. Uh,